we are live from the Shared Universe Studios here on the Jersey Shore. I'm Rob Akinpour. This is the A-Game. They are bringing it when they come here, and sometimes they actually come in the studio like Mike Varga has here done today. Thank you very much. Here I am. Appreciate you coming. Listeners need to know that there's a there's some heat lamps here. So I kind of <laughs> feel like I'm, I have the complexion of baked ham. So you know what? I'm hopefully starting to we, turn red, too, come to think of it. Hopefully we can color correct this. Can we fix this in post, CJ? Yeah. I'm just... It looks good. You look good. I'll, I'll, by the way, CJ Cullen will be on the board handling all this. I am dressed appropriately because my man is the uh, the king of the Irish, as you will see by one of his books. And matter of fact, give me photo number two so we can blow this up a little bit more, CJ. This is your brain Boom. on shamrocks. Mike Farragher has written six books. He is what you call the the king of Irish guilt. I think is the best way to describe it. Or you well, know a lot about it. And you once you write a book, you're officially a published pu- authority. Of there it. you like, go. I, I, can, well I can be. A, I can get a PhD now <laughs> in this if I if I needed to. And you really did write from your own personal experiences when it comes to living in an Irish Catholic family. For sure. Yeah. I mean, these books kind of started out as a lark. I mean, mm-hmm. if you kind of roll the tape back in my journalistic career, I was right. Worked for the Irish Voice uh, for a number of years. As a matter of fact, CJ, if you can put up number seven just to give them a plug and put the logo up there. And you were doing music back then. Uh, so I was I was the music critic yeah. for the Irish Voice. And of course, you know, March, everybody loves you because it's St. Patrick's Day. But yeah. October, not a lot going on in the Irish community. Mm, true. So I went to my editor one day and I'm like, you know, I tell these funny stories about growing up Irish and Catholic and guilty guilty mm-hmm. in uh, in the pub when I go out and people seem to laugh at it. And maybe I'm going to try to write this. Right. So I wrote this and I was always, you know, every time somebody laughed at something, I would always be mindful of where do they laugh and where do they not. So right. I almost like road tested them at the bar, mm-hmm. wrote them down. And the letters that came in to the editor were like, oh, my God, this is my mother. I grew up Irish Catholic and guilty. Right. And this is your brain on shamrocks is basically <laughs> when you wake up hungover on a Sunday morning and your mom knocks on the door and says, it's time for mass. You're like, mass is not going to happen. My mom and her Irish accent would say, well, I'm sure the Lord Jesus Christ didn't want to get up the day he died for your sins. Yes. <laughs> so it's like that guilt that, yeah. you know, I still don't have a, I'm 56 years old. I still don't have a tattoo <laughs> because I'm deathly afraid of my mom. She's still alive. <laughs> she's always like permeating my thoughts. Right. Um, and she's an awesome lady, by the way. Uh, and right. and CJ understands that too. And so you do I. Do, right? I I'm, I'm half Irish. I mean, my mother's side is the Lenahans. The Lenahans. So, oh my God. <laughs> so it's, it's every one of my mom and her sisters and they're all pretty much the same way masters of the guilt as i like this yeah yeah they know for sure for yeah. sure so I, I we were really blown away by the reaction of the column and then i did a compendium of the columns into the book so there right. was this is your brain on shamrocks and then the sequel which is this is your brain on shamrocks 2 50 shades of green, green. matter of fact cj scroll down a little bit we do have the photo i want to put it up there and by the way all these books are available if you go to amazon or any place that you buy books right. you will find these so worth your worth your investment so 50 shades of green came out around the time of 50 shades of gray and i thought that mm-hmm. was going to be a kind of a funny thing because no play on words, irish, obviously. <laughs> irish don't really talk about sex i mean my birds and the bees <laughs> discussion was one sentence it was like you know you didn't get that thing down there between your legs for stirring tea and that's like, <laughs> oh, oh my god, god. And i was like oh my god mom I don't have anything else. Gee, thanks, but, Mom. But uh, so it was kind of a play on on what was going on at the time, which was Fifty Shades of Grey. Right. I kind of shamelessly rode that. Why not Google it, search? Sure. <laughs> Why not go there? And what what's it like to, to to be able to do what you love to do? I mean, obviously, doing these books is there's a passion for you to write. There is, yeah, and there's also a passion to connect with people as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things, as I mentioned, the reason why the books got so successful was that, you know, you've got a Lenahan. So yeah. You, you can identify with the Irish Catholic oh, guilt. Oh, yeah, big time. <laughs> and here I was thinking, writing, because, you know, as a writer, you're always thinking, well, is this just me? Am I being self-indulgent? Mm-hmm. But when you actually release a book like something like this, and then everybody comes to you and like, this is my mother. Right. My grandmother did this. And you, you realize just how connected we all are because right. we have a shared story, especially mm-hmm. if you're an Irish or a Polish Catholic immigrant background. You know, we all have that situation of our parents were working class people. They put everything they had into us. Very true. And then all of a sudden, you know, like they would keep you on the straight and narrow with yeah. guilt and the Catholic <laughs> church and all that other fun stuff. <laughs> so it, it's very gratifying when you're, when your work connects with people. I think one of the greatest sales I ever had as a, in a, 
in the This Is Your Brain on Shamrock's book is I remember through the website somebody bought 15 copies. And I'm like, wow, are you sure that was only one copy? Right. Just maybe just typo. And, and the woman said, no, I actually bought this because my mom just passed away. She was on chemo. And this is the book that made her laugh during chemo. And I was like, oh, that's my beautiful. God, that's just. That's a beautiful. You know, so if you if your work connects with that in, yeah. in any way, shape, or form, it's extremely gratifying. I'll take it one step further because uh, Mike uh, Mike Farger has appeared on other podcasts, and I want to give props to Be Inspired. Lisa Anderson and the crew at WJRZ in Jersey. Um, have a, Yeah, they have a great podcast. Worth your time. Check it out. And I was checking it out, just, just boning up on my. And you touched me just by some things you said in that podcast, and I want to repeat a couple of them. It was three things that came out, and it's almost like digging into your fears and anxieties. One of them was, I'm not good enough. And yeah. I understand that feeling all too well because of the decisions I've made to go into radio and know that there's so much rejection. And it reminds me of my childhood because I was picked on a lot and, and dealing with that. And then also it spilled into adulthood, not feeling good enough in a relationship, not feeling good enough as a human being. So saying that made me feel like... The, I have to be connected in some way that he feels some of these things at one point in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's funny because I had the pleasure. I mean, I, I picked up a pen because of Frank McCourt. And Frank right. McCourt wrote Angela's Ashes, which is, of course, mm -hmm. he won the Pulitzer Prize. Prize. yeah. So I had interviewed him when he was about to read his third, write his third book, mm -hmm. release his third book, I should say. So again, this is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Right. And he's like... Oh my God! Hope think people are going to like it. You know, I mean, yeah. even at that level yeah. of literary, you still had your doubt and fears about the minute before this goes on sale, right. are people going to connect to it? So sure. even somebody at that high level mm -hmm. was still operating that. So I think that's just part of the human condition. And, yeah, and really, I tell people this all the time. You know, r Irish people are noted storytellers, and I think the difference between the Irish people that write books and the Irish people that don't, because every Irish person probably has enough stories <laughs> worthy of <laughs> book last writing. A lifetime, yeah. But it really is that 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 wall of am I good enough? Is this valuable? Is my voice valuable? Mm -hmm. It's the ones that jump over the wall get, have right. the books done, and then everybody else is very suppressed, and they're like, yeah. oh, I don't want to make a show of myself, right. or or who's going to buy this? Who's going to mm -hmm. read this? So. People have that dream, and then right behind you, there's that little voice inside your head that just crushes it. And and it's really that's a daily thing. Every every minute, I mean, I'm I'm writing something now, and I'm stuck a little bit. Wow. Uh, because I'm and here I am. This is my seventh book. I'm right. I'm like, how far do I want to go with this topic? Or is anybody right. going to write this? Is this resonating? And it. it it doesn't get any easier seven no, books it, in. No, it can't. I mean, yeah. I think the, the maybe the first one or two probably are, these were ideas I've always had. They're going to come spilling out. And then as you go along, you're looking for inspiration. Because I think what people don't realize is that a book is not something that you can just sit down and just blare it out. I mean, there may be a routine that goes with it. But if you don't have inspiration, then the art can't come to life. Well, I, I, I often say that inspiration without action mm -hmm. is just entertainment. And what I mean by that is everybody gets a burst of inspiration. Yeah. And it's it really is a gift from on high. Right. If you don't immediately take action on that inspiration, mm -hmm. then all you had was this momentary dream like, wow, this might happen. Yeah. You have to capture it and either write it down or if you had a song idea, right. get a guitar and start playing it. Like hold on to that inspiration and act on the inspiration. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it was just a momentary like dream. Right. Does that make sense? No, it does make sense. Yeah. So inspiration mm -hmm. without action is just a momentary entertainment. Well, let me ask you this, because listening to you and understanding that you are very confident in your writing, how, how does that confidence come about? Because I admit, still doing this and doing radio and other aspects of my life, I just don't have enough confidence in myself. So how do you deal with that? Or do you just kind of blow through it and say, I know I can do this, and you channel very positive you know, in your head? I think, first of all, you have to please yourself. That's the first thing. And that's not, you know, you're always your worst critic. Oh, but, my God. But I do think that, you know, there's just, again, there's this daily grind of, you know, I'm not good enough. Yeah. Is anybody going to read this now? I, I will tell you I'm working on something now. Mm -hmm. And I don't exactly know what it is and how it's going to turn out, but I know the title. Okay. The title mm -hmm. is My One Skinny Summer. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, you started to laugh, right? <laughs> so my one skinny summer. I haven't had one yet. Yeah, well, you haven't had I one did, yet. I honestly yeah. did have one. It was well, senior year of college. That's it. We, yeah. And I had one senior year of high school, right? So it's all those things where, you know, it started out to be this funny memoir about like that one skinny summer where you're really hot to trot. You had your Camaro. You had your mullet if it was in the 80s. And then, you know, you, you ended up piling on weight. Mm-hmm. And then what I'm noticing now is that, okay, you're 56 years old and you have weight on you and there's health consequences to that. Yeah, it's very true. So it's, it's a combination of started out really riotously funny mm-hmm. and now it's going into like what are the deep fears about – you know, leaving yeah. your family in the middle of the night because mm-hmm. you're you're carrying weight, and I'm like, does anybody want to read something like that? Which and is the question. Yeah. And, and, and but then you, so I have that comment, but then it's like, well, I'm going to push on through because I have seven books, right. six books rather, and every one of them has made money or breaking even or you know. So it's that's a that's a great so that's that's a yeah. track record absolutely that, and I know it resonates with people. So I'm I'm persevering. Despite the fact that I'm like, how far do I go with this? Right. You know, it, 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 it that never mm-hmm. goes away. Right. But you're also not afraid to kind of break away. I mean, from what I've been able to decipher, CJ, let me go back to uh, one of the photos you just downloaded. If you can go scroll down, um, the one above Fifty Shades, that one. There we go. Yeah. Collared. Now, this is a little different. Yeah, well, this, of a this, book. this one actually had to get out of the way mm-hmm. before I wrote the rest of the one. So Collard is a suspense novel set in the sex abuse scandals of the Catholic Church back right. in 2000. I wrote it back in 2004. Mm-hmm. And this was my way of processing the fact that it had happened to me. Wow. So I had um, a inappropriate relationship with a priest, uh, with a religious brother in my teens at my high school. It was an all-boy boy high school here in New Jersey. And essentially what I did was I wrote this fictional account pretending it wasn't me right? so that I can get an insight of how I felt about my church right. and how I felt about what happened. So I wrote the book. The first – classic Irish, we don't talk about things. Mm-hmm. The first book that got put in front of somebody was my mom and dad, and mm-hmm. I told them this is what happened because this is like a family friend. Right. Then the second book went to him, the the, the – religious brother that I, uh, that, you know, abused me. So, and I put that on his lap and I was like, I'm not cool with what you did. Mm-hmm. I'm on to you yeah. and I forgive you. And with this book, that really allowed me to take my power back. Mm, there you go. And then all the n- subsequent books with the frivolity of the shamrocks right. and all the humor mm-hmm. I just almost had a lance the boil or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, no, I get it. Say, I get it. You look, you almost had to just basically say, I have to get this, for lack of a better term, cancer out of my life. And yes. maybe this is your therapy in a sense of going. It's I'm going to write total therapy. Right. Every book I've ever released, which I've just recently come to this conclusion, every book that I've released, it is a moment of time for me about what I was thinking of and going through with this. At the same time, right. even if it's a fictional one or if it's a book of essays, it, mm-hmm. it it's a comment of what I was seeing, feeling, and doing at the time, which I think is pretty. That's been pretty interesting to yeah. recently discover that because it's not until months later after Collard came out mm-hmm. that it really hit me what this book was really about, right. which was about my own journey yeah. to to forgive, to take my power back, and to move on. Right. You know, like if if that guy came in right now into this podcast studio. I shake his hand and we go out for a drink after. And I'll tell you something. I don't know many people that could do that. Yeah. So, I mean, that says a lot about you. It says a lot about your character. But it's also a book that I think if you have somebody in your life that has gone through something like this, it's worth looking into. And somebody who has, unfortunately, yeah. had to go through that. Yeah. And and now, you know, I, I hadn't read that book since it came out in 2004. I recently reread it and I thought, wasn't bad. <laughs> and what I and I started to write a script on it because I do think that right. um my book company at the time thought this would be a really great script. They invested some money into it to shop it around Hollywood. Oh wow. At the time everybody was like, Oh, this is too hot. Mm-hmm. And besides, this scandal's gonna go away soon. Well uh, guess what? Twenty no. some odd years later, we're still talking about it. I, I can see I can see this on a Netflix very so, easily. So so I am writing a script. Anybody that's out there and you're interested in making a book like that, let's make a movie. <laughs> CJ's right over there. He's a filmmaker. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> And that's one thing about Mike Farragher. He is more than just books. You have you've shot a couple of things, and I'm going to play one of your pilots that you've been uh, trying to sell. And it's about some of the things 
things that we've talked about, some of the funny lines that you've already said you've incorporated into a show idea called McLean Avenue. Give me a little more setup on this. Well, McLean Avenue was, again, as I mentioned, I was at the Irish Voice. Mm -hmm. I was a music columnist, so I would go to these shows, and mm -hmm. especially McLean Avenue is its like another county of Ireland in Yonkers, New York. Mm -hmm. And you would see these amazing people, right. uh, first of all, on the stage, what they were doing backstage, and then what the fans were doing. It's its really a community and tight-knit Irish people. And, and the thing that I wanted to do here was – so I, I was immersed in that kind of a community reporting on it. But then the second thing is, you know, there are great shows out there like Shameless and It's mm -hmm. Always Funny, it's Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. Really funny shows and whatnot. However, they always portray the Irish as super effed up. <laughs> and there is a case of that. Yeah. But however, the Irish people that I hang out with in a bar, we don't get drunk we're like cutting each other and busting each other. You know what? <laughs> These are sharp intellect minds that nice. that interplay was no, something I never really saw. I never saw myself on the screen. Right. And I thought there's a whole bastion of people out there that aren't drunks and F ups and they're just, they're bankers and they're finance yeah. people. I mean, I'm a VP of sales in my other life. Right. So, I mean, there are really functioning people <laughs> that are really sharp witted that mm -hmm. I've never seen that kind of a thing portrayed. So, you know, as as in most art or most books or TV, you always, as the creator, in some cases, you might be trying to represent yourself because you have yet to see that out there. That and makes, I think that that's makes really, yeah. so McLean Avenue was just a collection of those stories that I would, I would get. I mean, it's, it's a story about a, a down and out Irish tenor mm -hmm. who goes out and sings in St. Patrick's Cathedral and he's like, has the voice of an angel, but he's a complete sexual deviant. <laughs> and, you know, he lives with his mother and, right. and he, he gets caught in the Me Too movement. Yes. She's starting to get her sexual awakening. Awakening, so Just speak, as yeah. she, he's getting punished for his sexual awakening. <laughs> so that dynamic in the house I yeah. thought was really funny. And um, we had Joe Rooney from Father Ted, who anybody that's on BritBox or whatever, he's a, a comedy legend in – in Dublin, we're so lucky to get him. Yeah. So it all sort of came together when we filmed it. And again, I just thought that was a really funny concept of, you know, somebody being uh, me too mm -hmm. just as his mother is, you know, reaching her <laughs> second sexual peak. I thought that was an interesting juxtaposition and bringing in the Irish guilt and the views on sexuality mm -hmm. and the wise asses at the bar that are always commenting. I just thought that's a that's an Irish stew I want to bathe in. <laughs> in Hollywood, they would call this a sizzle roll. This is a five-minute sample of what McLean Avenue would look like. CJ, if you fire it up, let's enjoy it all together here on The A-Game. Check it out. I pressed your white shirt, your black tie, and your suit is in the dry cleaning bag in the closet. Thanks, Ma. And just on cue here, our singer, Sean McCabe, has arrived, is here to sing Our Lady of Knock. My queen of peace, as we kneel with love before you, Lady of Knock, my queen of peace. Jesus would want, you know, the best for both of you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... My mom walked in on me, uh, jerking off to a porno bag. <laughs> you fucking kidding me. Oh my God. So disturbing on so many levels. <laughs> this 
is a, an odd place for a confession. <laughs> uh, is this, uh, this better, Father? <laughs> okay, your ma said you wanted to talk for real. Clearly she got the wrong impression. You're turning into one of those stodgy church ladies, old before her time. You're beginning to sound like Sean. He actually thinks that I should make one of those profile pics for those online dating scenes. <laughs> Well, then the hell has frozen over because I agree with Sean. Well, by Jesus, if you got the priest's blessing, sure, what more do you need? I'm sure, I don't know. Do you ever use anything to help, like toys? Sad, Jesus, mad, you're correct. We have to bring in the Where heavy machine. Back in your bag. I'm not having any of it. I'm supposed to date a redhead. I wore a wig. Are, Are you, you my, my date tonight? tonight? Oh, my oh God. Jesus. Oh, my God. Uh... Bartender. Yes. I'm going to need a whiskey. Welcome to our town. get a lot of laughs out of that for sure <laughs> and yeah and, and that's the thing i can see this on streaming easily yeah this has a place it absolutely especially does. after this week right i mean we you know, had the banshees of inisherin and yeah. there's a record number of irish uh you know uh, irish films and actors being recognized so yeah uh, hollywood's one of those things where you kind of have to wait for your turn in the sun where you suddenly become hip again so i would assert that hopefully Mm -hmm. Being Irish is hip again with all these nominations. So, yeah, again, exactly. if anybody's listening and it's there, I've got 10 episodes written, <laughs> done, in, you know, we're ready to go. Um, so, it's a matter of, you know, with these trailers, and, and CJ knows this as well, you go through the film festival circuit, right? Of which CJ is, is a member of as well. And you try to just, it's the sample. It's like the Annie Ann's pretzels, the little tiny pretzels. Yeah, exactly. To get you in there and buy the rest of it. So, that's what we're, that we're doing now. And it's done extremely well in the film festivals and Beautiful. i do think that a lot of people whether you're irish or not kind of see that the bar scene and the mother dynamic mm -hmm. it's 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 hopefully certainly irish centric but it's a very universal theme as well for sure i, I agree with that and i also since you're a music guy by yes. the way um i think you know a special shout out to some of the things you hear in the soundtrack of that trailer and the rest of the show black 47 yes um which uh, you know helped me become interested in my own culture they mixed traditional music which i did not understand of irish right. ireland and then they mixed it with hip-hop beats so larry kerwin's a good friend uh, yeah I, I realized that you have a podcast you had him on your podcast I had him on, too yeah, um, black so. 47 was in the 90s funky kaylee just became this surprise exactly. hit out of exactly. nowhere but it was everywhere on the radio if you're around the new york area there was not one station i wasn't playing funky kaylee and at the ending credits the narrowbacks uh, mm -hmm. seamus uh, keen and his brothers uh, Bastards of the Burrows, that is, and then Shillelagh Law, which is the funniest one of all, and, and Jameson's Revenge, <laughs> the uh, the traditional Irish music when the guy is, <laughs> you know, pleasuring himself. Uh, they were like, wow, we, we lent you the music. Right. We didn't know you were going to do that with Right, it. exactly. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> but, you know, I, th I thought it was, all, it was very important because I was a music columnist to not just tell the stories in the po in the show, but also make sure that we had the soundtrack being evocative of the music that was mm -hmm. on that street when I was there. Right. Um, so that's 
that the, the intersection of the soundtrack plus the the film is really exciting for me. Even I would I got goosebumps just looking at it again. That's it's great. Really, yeah. really fun. You're kind of setting me up here a little bit because I did want to dive into your musical past because some of the people you've interviewed, true or false, you've interviewed Sinead O'Connor. I interviewed Sinead O'Connor. Wow. Uh, I've interviewed Joe Strummer a yeah. couple weeks before he died. That's crazy. What was that? Not knowing that he was going to die a couple weeks later. Yeah. But when you when you look back on it and you do the article and then that happens, there has to be this feeling, oh, my God, I got one of the last interviews of Joe Strummer. It was. It was, it was really amazing. I just remember there was – I always ask people, you know – House is on fire, and you have to run back in and get your favorite CD. What's in your hand? And he goes, <clears throat> "Exile on Main Street." <laughs> and then the second question is, "Friends are coming over for dinner, and you have to hide the most embarrassing CD in your collection. What's in your hand?" And he goes, "Doris Day's Great." Is <laughs> and then he goes, and then he goes, "Scrat, I'm not embarrassed by that. Doris Day rocks." But great. I have to tell you, he was so amazing. Um, that that was one of the highlights of my journalistic career. I will tell How could you, it not really. The other highlight, which actually changed my life, was I interviewed uh, Bob Geldof. Mm. So Bob Geldof, live Boomtown Aid. Rats, <clears throat> Live Aid, please. Boomtown Town Rats, whole nine yards. He had just come out with a, an album called Sex, Death, and something else. Was that the one with This Is the World Coming was on that album? I think maybe not. I, I don't know, okay, but anyway, yeah. Sex, Love, and Death. I that's think that's what it's called. Death, okay, and it was actually for anybody that doesn't know. He was married. Mm -hmm. Michael Hutchins busted up the marriage. marriage. They had a child. Mm -hmm. Both his ex-wife and Michael Hutchins uh, pass away, yeah. and Bob Geldof adopts the child. child. And I was interviewing him at the time of this, and I was like, it was such a dark, raw album. And I'm like, how could you actually put this on vinyl yeah, because sure. your kids Le are going to listen to this That's a legitimate someday. question. And his answer, one sentence, changed the trajectory of your life. He goes, if you worry about what people think, art dies. Great that one sentence, yeah. because at the time, again, we were talking about the confidence thing. Sure. I was wondering, should I put Collard out? Mm -hmm. Should I be that vulnerable to right. say that this happened to me? I'm, I went from victim to victorious. Should I actually share that journey with people? Mm -hmm. And when he said that, if I worry about what people think art dies, mm -hmm. that freed me up for some reason. And nine months later, the book was out. I got. I, that's I, what I needed to hear yeah. at that time. Yeah, I can see that, and I can. I can honestly say it, it helps me a lot hearing this too, because as somebody who has a lot of doubts in every aspect of his life, you're right, and I think sometimes I lack the vulnerability of putting all of it out there. And I realize what you just said: you have to be willing to put it all, or else you're going to get nothing. Vulnerable. Easy for me to say. Vulnerable. Vulner oh, oh, <laughs> vulnerability. vulnerability is strength. Yeah, you know it is, and I'm up, I'm up against it now because again. Yeah. With the one skinny summer concept, sure. I'm like, God, how deep do I go here? Right. You know, and you always still have that thing in the back of your head. But if I know every time I've been vulnerable and I've shared my truth in books or whatever I've done, it's always paid off and it's always worked out all right. So that's a good message. I have a I have a track record mm -hmm. and yet I'm still dealing with that. So for anybody that's out there, you know, the things that keep people from being creative are putting the time on your calendar to do it and then also just setting those doubts and fears to the side and doing it anyway. Good message. For sure. Mike Farragher's here on the A-game. We've come to the halfway point, and that means it's random shot time. I got random questions. I usually try to have a random shot, and this was the only – when you have an Irishman and you don't bring Jamesons, you're in trouble. So I had to bring – and I brought the black barrel. You had to. Had to. Mainly because I got to admit – and, and he had to break out the finest china, by the way. Yeah, please. really. But the, the, the thing about Jamesons, and this is where I get that – Ask an Irishman Whoa. about this. Oh, I'll take the heavy one. Never no, no, no. You could. I, I, I thought I was going to get that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Then As you take the guest. heavy one. You're right. You should get the heavy one. I was like, I didn't. I was like, oh, did, I go too he guest. did I go too heavy on that board? No. Not uh, at all. You'd well, be my favorite bartender. Thank you. Red Bank. But when it comes to Jameson's, because it's been going through a, an interesting change because it's always been the traditional Irish whiskey. I had this and I can't go back to Jameson's. But have you tried any other flavors like the orange or the IPA or the coffee stout? Well, and, the, the coffee one is great with. You know, espresso drinks, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's just top shelf. And then the orange one is a good summer drink in that when you mix it with like orange flavored seltzer and things like that. I like this. Or like even the ginger ale. Like a lot of people do Jameson's yeah, like and ginger. Too. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of it for sure. Cool. Well, I would drink this to you and say thanks for coming on. I also want to give props to Watch Jimmy it. Steele from 95.9 The Rad for recommending this gentleman for coming on this podcast. So thank you, Jimmy. Thank you very much. No problem. That's right, Drool. That was great. Okay, let it go, Rob. All right, random shots. 
We're going to go a little bit of music, a little bit of Irish, and a little bit of food. Oh. Yeah. I, I know. I know. Unfortunately, the food part I know all too well. <laughs> but I'm gonna I start. wish I didn't know the food yeah, one as I'm well. Sorry. I wouldn't be writing my one skinny summer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but I will start with this, because recently you made an appearance at Monmouth University here in Long Ranch, New Jersey. Tuesday night. I can't even talk. Damn. Tuesday night Music Club series, you were uh, going over the Murmur album from R.E.M. So let's talk R.E.M. If you had to pick three songs from R.E.M. that perfectly represents the band to you. What do you pick? I'd pick South Central Rain. Good choice. I'd pick um, Radio Song. Another good one. I really like that one mm-hmm. as well. And I also think the fast version of Drive. Oh, I know that, that one. Remix? Yes, yeah. I have. Because I'll tell you what, mm-hmm. like the Drive is a great song and it's acoustic and whatnot, yeah. but they went on a couple of shows and I think it might have been bootlegged or whatever, mm-hmm. but then they like rocked that one yeah, out and yeah, it was yeah. a really, really good version. I also think, you know... South Central Rain, Don't Go Back to Rockville. That's on my top I mean, three. Th- that would be it yeah. as well. That's such a great band. And actually, they're in preparing for that talk mm-hmm. with uh, Dr. Ken Womack, so shout out to him, um, I, I really got how they were really good right until the end. You know, a lot of people they maybe really stopped were. paying attention to them mm-hmm. after their 80s and 90s heyday, but the last two or three albums are great. They got know? lost. They definitely they did really lost, did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for me, like when you mentioned South Central Rain, that's the first song I ever heard by REM. Working at FM 1063 WHCG on the Jersey Shore, Radio Free Europe is like a staple song. Yeah. So that became a personal fave. King of Comedy is another one, too. Another good one. That, yeah. that whole uh, album was very glam. Yeah. I, I dug all of it. It's, again, at times at times people thought, oh, they're overrated. No, they're, deep down, they're an underrated band. They should be appreciated. All right, in music, better Irish drinking songs since we are sipping on some Jamesons. Uh, would it be the Pogues version of Whiskey in the Jar or would it be the Clancy Brothers doing Whiskey or the Devil? Ooh, do you really <laughs> have to make me choose? I always have one that makes everybody go, why? Why I, did you I, do I, that? I, 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 would, I, I would actually offer a third one, and that would be the Dubliners and the Pogues doing the Irish Rover. Oh, that is a great That's a great version. one, right? Oh my I God, mean, that, yeah. and I have a funny Pogue story if you want to hear the Shane McGowan oh, story. Oh, please. I was a big fan of the Pogues. So I saw Shane McGowan, Irving Plaza, wrote up a great review. Right. I met him backstage. He was like, gone and then all of a sudden that, by the way that was his reputation back in totally, the day but all of a sudden he like stumbled in front of the microphone and then his eyes lit up uh-huh. and he sang every word oh wow and there was a woman behind me that said that's the first time i ever cheered a heroin addict on i feel dirty and i wrote that in the article <laughs> oh, wow and he threatened in a lawsuit with the com- with my with my newspaper oh my god <laughs> and then like you know, it was touch and go for a while there, and I got kind of like the hairy eyeball the next time I went to see him. Right. But then, you know, of course, he doesn't have much of a memory left, so he came towards me backstage once. I thought he was going to punch me in the mouth. He's like, how you doing, man? You know, like all things <laughs> He forgot all about it. But, but it was really – I'll never forget, like, how is this guy going to make it on the stage? But as soon as the music started, there was this fire in his eyes, yeah. and he just killed it. And he's one of the greatest – poets yeah musicians ever and you know fairy tale in new york that song will live forever yeah and they tried to like you know say oh it's all sensitive we shouldn't be saying this come on it's a great song Mm -hmm. it's christmas it means christmas to so many of us but right i would say um you know we were talking a little bit earlier just as an acknowledgement to you rob is that you know i listened to you on the hdg days and that was one of the greatest radio stations and you're you were part of a a DJ team that was just really second to none. Thank you. But, um, you know, really, I was at MCX at the time in 1988, the Monmouth, U- Monmouth University's, University's radio station. Radio station. Yeah, and absolutely. I remember being the music director where Rum sat on me in the lash, <laughs> bounced into the, the the studio and hearing that, <laughs> that Irish music plus the punk. Right. I can remember dropping the needle. I can remember exactly what I was, wow. what I was wearing, because it was a transformative moment for That's Irish so, music. Right. It was amazing. Well, how do you feel about some of the bands like Dropkick Murphys and what they're doing? They're great. Yeah. You know, they're great. I mean, you know, some of them might be a bit reductive mm-hmm. compared to the Pogues, but sure. I think one of the things around the Pogues, which um, is a great song, and, and my favorite song of the Pogues is the Turkish song of the Damned, because it goes into a Turkish Middle Eastern mm-hmm. vibe, right. but then it turns on a dime and becomes an Irish reel. Right, brings it, which, yeah. Which, if you really look at the narrative, it says 
all this traditional music is the same. There's not that much. There's a fine line between mm-hmm. what's Turkish and what's Irish. Good point. And I think that, it, that, first of all, it takes a crackerjack band to pull that off. No, I agree with that. And that's when you separate the Pogues from everybody else in my yeah. mind. Dropkick Murphys up in Boston, they do amazing music, but they, they also really do can. amazing charitable work. That's what I've heard. Um, they're, they're, you know, the Tossers. You've got flogging Molly. Flogging Molly. Uh, you know, so there's they're all from the loins, so to speak, the musical loins of Shane McGowan. Can I say loins on this podcast? I think I'm you can say sure. you can pretty much say what you want here, so don't <laughs> worry about that. Um, let me go this way with uh, more underrated Irish rockers, the Water Boys or Snow Patrol. Two different generations going on here, but I, I actually and both think, of them both of them had like one significant hit. Yeah, they, well, I would say Snow Patrol. Well, Snow Patrol, I, the guy's name escapes me at the moment, but the guy from Snow Patrol, who's I think dating or married to Courtney Cox, he's co-written most of Ed Sheeran's music, a lot of Ed Sheeran's wow, music. Wow, so I didn't realize that. that. I didn't put that together. That right? guy's getting his day in the sun. Okay, I, fair I, enough. I, I yeah. still think the Water Boys. You know, if you look at the Water Boys again, even their late stage stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing stuff. So you have the Hole in the Moon, which everybody yeah. knows. But one of my favorite albums of all time is an appointment with Mr. Yates. And what he does is he takes yeah. Yates's poetry mm-hmm. and he puts it to music, and it's like unbelievable. I'm, what I'm happy about is that a, a song like Fisherman's Blues has wound up in several motion pictures, yeah. not just one. People have discovered this, and I'm glad the filmmakers have put to, to use so people now know that song because that was always the, my favorite, and I want. Uh, why don't more people know about Fisherman's Blues? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you know he he changes his style all the time. There's, he does. There's a recent song he has called the Connemara Fox, mm-hmm. and it's just like this thumping, rocking, bluesy song. Mm-hmm. And he's got like the 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 vocal effects on his voice. It's, right. It's just like it's great. <laughs> you know, I'm still such a fan of of almost everything he does. See, I knew I had to go into music with you. Yeah, you knew I had to do. I had to do, to go, to do this. We're going deep. <laughs> but I'm gonna go a little more Irish now. Who do you think is a bigger Irish personality? Now, they're both Irish in their descent and where they're from. Fighter Conor McGregor or talk show host Graham Norton? I have to say I'm not a Conor. Not a McGregor fan. I can respect I'm not, that. Yeah, I'm, a so, huge, I'm a huge Graham Norton like, fan. So I'm a huge Graham Norton fan. and I think he's, uh, you know, what people don't know about Graham Norton because you see a lot of the YouTube videos, but he's also a, a fantastic novelist. I, so he's got a few books out. Wow, okay. And uh, the books are very... Uh, they're critically acclaimed in Ireland, and they're also, um, you know, I, I understand they're popular as well. So that's a guy that is a real storyteller, and I love him as an interviewer because he's just keeping the party going. And, that's exactly what And it's what really I love not him. about him. No, right? he doesn't you know, make it about him. And, you know, hats off to you as a podcast guest uh, host. You're the same way. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you're hosting the show, but it's not about you. It's about your guest, and he gets that, yeah. you know. He does it in a way that, like, whereas Conor McGregor, it's all about him. No, it is. You're right, Conor McGregor. <laughs> him and his, I'm all about Conor McGregor. Him and, his, him and his crappy whiskey, by the way. If, if you <laughs> you've had, served, had it, okay. How if, bad is it, by the way? If you served me that, I would have. I wouldn't have even put my lips to it. I'm just saying. <laughs> I love proper, it. I love proper it. Proper twelve. <laughs> I don't know if I could say this. We could edit, we could fix this in post, but it's shite. Shite. It's shite. shite. <laughs> Which is, you know what, yeah. with an E at the end of Pretty it. Pretty much. Yeah, so I'm not a fan of uh, Proper 12. Yeah. It's it's undrinkable. But you summed up Graham Norton perfectly because anytime you watch it, it is a party. He's not afraid. And I feel like the the actors or the musicians, when they're there, they can let loose a little bit more. Because oh, for sure. Because they're overseas, they're drinking, and Graham has a way of just making them feel so relaxed. It's like going... And it's the be- you know the curtain of this is the, I- the British stip over upper lip that he's dealing with so mm. the fact that he could break these stiff upper lip wall yeah. and get that out of people mm-hmm. is even more I think impressive yeah. and I think he's fantastic I, I really I, do I think he's brilliant I agree with that wholeheartedly okay I'm gonna go to Irish food uh, CJ get photos 8 and 9 ready okay so which one would you choose out of this number 8 the uh, that would be the uh, Irish potato candy or number 9 the traditional Irish soda bread well, I don't want to brag or anything, but I uh, I make a killer soda bread. Seriously? Say, because everyone I've ever had has been drier than dirt. I mean, no, drier no. than sand, actually. Well, you got to use it. You got to you got to you got to use it. You got to use a mixer. You got to add butter. Yeah. You got to the the raisin quotient is is key. Um, yeah, I, take a look at this photo. This does not look like there's enough raisins. Uh, by the in way, this I didn't make that one that's in the photo. No, no. Yeah, well, let's I, let it get straight. It, yeah. 
Let's get that straight. That is not a Mike Farragher creation in any way, shape, and or form. I, I will tell you, I, I'll also mix it with like mixed berries and whatnot. And, See, my, okay. and my mother has it because I, I, I put an egg in there. Yeah. I make it a little bit cakier. And my mother's like, you know, well, this isn't the way uh, we made it now. And this isn't the way you were raised to make it now. And I'm like, <laughs> you're eating it. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it came in third in the... Uh, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church uh, uh, Irish Bake Off in March. They were they were like blown away that a man would enter. And I was like, I got this, ladies. Come on. Yeah, it's like Mike Drop right there. Got, Thank I you got, very much. I got robbed by the pastor, by the way. I think I don't know. No, it was it was really great. And uh, you know, it's 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 good. I love my Irish heritage. I I I don't even know what that Irish potato thing is. Is that like the uh, the, the coconut? Yeah, pull it up. Pull like, it up. Like CJ, if, pull up number if, eight again. Yeah, this is this is that. It's got the coconut. It's got the well, cinnamon. Let's, let's, yeah. take, let's take a look and do a deep dive with this. Okay. As if you'd find coconut in Ireland, first of all. Are Ooh. they growing anywhere? Ooh. Just like the coconut. Where would I get a feckin' coconut like? <laughs> would I go to the, I don't know, where's the, where's that grown anyway? Is that in the Car 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 Caribbean? <laughs> You know, well said, sir. I mean, unless you have the mounds, of course. Mm. But uh, you know, no. I I think soda bread is good. I also think that um, you know, shout out to my the Dublin House as well, yeah. which is local as well as in Red St. Bank. Stephen's Green, and there's plenty of places St. like Stephen's that. Green is a great place. Um, you know, you can still get a traditional Irish breakfast served hot with the uh, the, the puddings, the rashers, mm -hmm. and the. And the beans, and this is as good of a time as any to tell everybody that I also have a podcast, and yes, the podcast please. is called Taste, mm -hmm. which is how an a an Irish person from the west of Ireland would say taste. Mm -hmm. I uh, I decided to do this sort of play on Stanley Tucci's. Uh, oh yeah, the, the, his uh, journal of uh, going over to Italy and all the places. So how many times in. did you like? There are these mouth watering things. Oh my god, yeah, that are amazing that I've seen in on the, CNN. In, yes. the, <laughs> in the Irish culture, which is interesting, in the Irish culture, we spend a lot less time on meals because we want to get them out of the way to have the tea and the chat. <laughs> so the desserts are amazing. Yes, that's true. And, but it's like you know, the food is just mm -hmm. sustenance. Get it out of the way so we can have a <laughs> three hour tea session with. With the chat. So uh, that's the main difference between the Irish and Stanley Tucci. So I thought that was an interesting, like, yeah. difference in the culture. So I called it Taste, and we've had Larry Kerwin on. Yeah, I think that's great. We've, that had, had, uh, yeah. we've had Joni Madden from Cherish the Ladies. She's oh, going to be coming to, to Monmouth University in a little bit. We've also had Celtic women on. We've had nice. a number of people on. And my wife, the smiling voice, Barbara Farraher, is our producer. So I couldn't have done it without her. But it's been it's been really great because the Irish Central, which has been, you know, a newspaper and 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 a website, had didn't really branch it to podcasts. And I had this idea, so we kind of married it together, and it's been it's been a ton of fun, a lot of work, but it's been right. a lot of fun. But it's it's great that you kind of brought them in a weird way to the 21st century to say, hey, look, if we're going to continue, if you're going to continue as the Irish Central, this is something you need to dive into. Yeah, and you brought them a product. Which is even better. Makes it I brought him a product, and you know they they seem to be very happy with it. And I watch me get canceled next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, before you get canceled, I got one more random shot, and I'm going to go to photo number ten. CJ, I'm going to ask potatoes. I would never think Pringles from an Irishman. Well, this is a very special picture because my wife and I are married thirty years next month. Bravo! Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, you know so. Any woman that's put up with me all, that long, <laughs> her spot in heaven is is there. But sainthood. Thirty years ago, we actually were so broke. Uh, we went to St. Martin. We were so broke. The last night of our honeymoon, we had a can of Pringles for dinner because we like maxed out our credit cards and everything else. So thirty years later, last week, we came with back with the kids, and that picture that you just showed was. A can of Pringles with a bottle of champagne because we were a little bit better prepared. Yeah. Uh, and we just really celebrated a wonderful life. I have wonderful kids. We have so very, very blessed with a, a, a loving partnership of a marriage. And I'm not just saying that because she's in the room. <laughs> and uh, so that, that picture is actually a little emotional for me because it's a, it's a real arc of how far we've come. So, that says a lot. Yeah. Right it on. says a lot. Uh, CJ, get the photos together because I'm going to go run down all the books real quick. Again, if you we, go to- we, we went this far and I didn't sell a book yet? No, Come you on. didn't sell Operators a book yet. Operators well, are standing by, wanna... people. Right. This is your brain on Shamrocks is one of the books that he has available. Go down to the next photo because we did not mention this. But The Last Temptation of Mary is also in his collection. Down to number five, please, for this one. Yeah, then he's got the book here. To number five, 
Come on. Come on. Open it, CJ. Really? There we go. Nine rooms. <laughs> So real real quick on this one this this is set in a bed and breakfast as a, as a matter of fact. Yeah, so a little bit bit of a backstory yeah. on this. Um, you know, typical Irish I'm going to make a long story long. Yeah. Um, but uh, nine rooms of Ballygloon and I went back to Ireland and my my uncle had lost part of his home in a fire and he was staying in this bed and breakfast and I went up there and by the way that's a picture for my daughter Maura she painted the actual oh, wow. bed and breakfast and there were nine rooms nine red doors right and I had tea with the innkeeper and I was like this place is awesome it's like an it's like an old carriage house old country irish carriage house and she goes ah sure you know you get all sorts here. You get like the the Belgian band players and everything else, and people that are having an affair in the weekend. And I, <laughs> yeah, I should write a book. And I just looked her in the eye, and I'm like, "You better hurry up before I do." <laughs> so I went up. I went up that. Right. I went up that driveway. No intention to write a book. I came down with a book idea, and here was the book idea that I had. There were two stories that were going on in this little town of Ballygloonan. Right. One of them was that was where the train station for the Quiet Man. It's located oh there. Oh, my God. Classic so they were, movie. They oh, were, my God. Yes, yes, They were yes, trying yes, to make yes. that into a historical place. So that's really happy, and it's really a lot of fun. And I went there. It's been it's awesome. On the other side of town in Athen Rye, mm-hmm. their story had just broken when I was there that the Bon Secours nuns had buried 700 bodies, uh, infant bodies, from their orphanage that they had in town for unwed mothers. So they would take the unwed mothers in, and if the baby died, they'd bury him in the back. So here you had this, like, gruesome story. Yeah. And then on the other side of town is, like, you know. This thing, yeah. The jewel of Irish-American memories is the quiet man, right? So I thought, like, that's really funny that, you know, so, and then I was looking at the Irish Times and the New York Times, and I took stories that were ripped from those newspapers at the time and I made a short story and filled each of the nine doors with nine stories out of that. Nice. And it just it just kind of came to me and I started to write it as soon as I made the journey home actually on the plane. Yeah. And that's just the way creativity is. You really have to be open to ideas and not just swat them away because oh who'd buy that? No, it's well, let's, well let's, said. let's just like spool that a little yeah. bit. So that's really been that's a I wanted to tell that story because I think it's an example of you want to be open to creativity and you never know where the next idea is going to come from. Well, it's well said. Speaking of which, photo number six, we didn't even mention this before we get out of here. A Devilish Pint is another book in his series. Again, we're talking about Amazon. and Wherever you get your books online, you can purchase this. Real quick, uh, uh, Devilish Pint, what would they expect on this one? So Devilish Pint, was a, it's an interesting one uh, because it is – I had a dream uh, – that I had read this book called Conversations with God, which is really great. Mm-hmm. And I had a dream that night that after reading the book on the plane, going to a business trip in Belgium, I had a dream that the devil was on the hood of my car. He looked a little like Jack Nicholson. He, goes, <laughs> he looked like Jack. He points, he points to the church, the local guy. He points to the church and he goes, let's go to an Irish pub. I'm going to tell you how life really works. <laughs> and he, there was this story that he told in the dream mm-hmm. about how life worked. And I woke up, and it was one of those – I'm still getting chills. It was one of those things where it was such a profound message that I was like, wow, that that would be a sin to not do something with that. Mm-hmm. So I sort of built this story around it. It's just a conversation about life and faith and, and you know, the, the upshot of it, and this is what I believe spiritually, is if, if God created you in his image, then God's perfect, you're perfect – and the quote unquote devil doesn't have horns. It's more of those doubts and fears we were talking about. Wow. So anything that see, keeps you from your potential. See, that hits me. Take the case that yeah. that's the devil. It's not somebody with red, red face and horns. It's, mm-hmm. you know, God made you, mm-hmm. you're perfect. And all those disempowering thoughts are whatever you want to call it, the devil or whatever. But it's taking you from God's potential that he had in you. And, and I, I really believe that. That's, I think wow. that could be a universal thing. And, the Muslim faith and the Jewish faith, and no matter what faith you dis- you you subscribe to, we you, know, you could all agree that that higher power is is perfect, and you you exist in that person, and 
the doubts and fears is what keeps you from that potential. And that's no, really I, I have to agree with that one. That's one of my favorite. Yeah. That's, I have to say that's one of my favorite books. As somebody who's been going through a lot of that, especially recently with the doubts and the fears, I say that one thousand percent because it's made me recently just sign up for therapy again, and I'm sitting here going. Okay, I feel like I'm having a therapy session well, with by Mike. The, I mean, by, by the way, I have some notes on this. Podcast. Oh, thank you. I'm going to need it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I've got some notes. No, no, I, but you know what? It's, it is it is good. I mean, I, I will just tell you for, for what it's worth. I mean, please. Um, I was super excited about here, uh, about uh, being here with you because, you know, again, you, you know, you were sort of, you were part of something super special within WHTG. And I remember. Even though we're the same age, yeah, I grew up listening to you and and how you created things and the music scene that we had at the at the Green Parrot and you know all of those things. It was such you know when, I, when you invited me on, I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna get interviewed by this guy. So I have wow. a if you could if you could see yourself how I see you as somebody that's made such a contribution. I wish I to could. To be, I'm being honest with you. I wish I could because I'm like I'm like thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, but it's like. That's probably been my biggest problem in my life. I wish I could see that. It's gotten me in trouble in relationships, in career, in life. CJ, can it's we get okay. a couch in here? So yeah, well, I, need the, I need the freaking couch now. CJ, <laughs> get us a couch stat into the no. With that, but, but, you know, but, but again, we all have, therapy too. You're yeah. therapy too, but you know, we we all have a version of that. Yeah, and, and that makes us so. That's just so. It's just basic human condition that you're going to be you're going to have those doubts and fears yeah. and I, I have to tell you and you know another credit to this where credit's due I took a course a, year, a number of years ago called the Landmark Forum and um, and Please. it was it was I'm not not familiar with it this was, it was an amazing course and what it does is it allows you to just really take a look at those disempowering areas that are holding you back from your potential wow. and getting to the root cause of that and going okay well, is that going on right now in my life? No. Okay, why don't I drop it? And it was a whole weekend of just doing that. And I probably, in that whole weekend, I probably did, you know, 90 years of therapy. Wow. So, so it, 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 yeah. was, it was allowing me to decompartmentalize yeah, the, the places where right. I was feeling uh, disempowered and bringing myself down interrupting that thought process and going thanks for sharing right. and you know, just moving on and doing it anyway so well, that actually makes me feel a little better because i think i've had a tendency of compartmentalizing a lot of stuff and i think people do do that but it's not healthy to try to do that with everything in your life you know yeah, what i mean you yeah know? and i'm you know i'm not discounting therapy or yeah or anything else like that it's it's listen whatever gets you through the night as john Amen. lennon would say yeah but, it's all right but for me it really was that course well it was that course but also the subsequent books that I've written right. in in one way, shape, or form helped me understand myself and my world. Absolutely. And, and I wish that for everybody else. And in fact, what I what I also like to, to talk about is for anybody that's local here, I do host a Rise and Write event on the third Saturday of the month because at this point, six books in, enough about me and my books and having my name on the cover of a book, I really get charged right now from the contribution I can make to other people writing their books. So if I can actually wow, be mentioned in page two, yeah, as it, in the acknowledgement, yeah, for you know, thanks. That, that's yeah. actually more valuable to me right now than having a seventh book with my name on it because I know I made a difference in that person's life, and I'm able to, I'm able to put pay it forward to allow people to be self-expressed and get their power the way the written word has helped me with my power. For sure. Amen to that. I will put up the other two just because we're wrapping this just up. Just because we're trying to sell books. Yeah, and, we are by still the way, trying you all, to do that. You only, have a few, <laughs> you only have a few shopping weeks until St. Patrick's Day, folks. So Yeah, exactly. So make great <clears throat> gifts. Give the gift of Irish kilt. Uh, CJ, the last two photos, if you would, we'll start with Fifty Shades. Now, uh, that one collared. Can I still be drinking whiskey even though we stopped the, the, oh, yeah, absolutely. the random shots? No, section. please. Okay, please indulge. And, Collard, and, and highly don't, recommend. Don't let me interrupt you, by the way, in pushing my books. Go ahead. <laughs> no, this is what I do at the end of every podcast. Collard, please get that. It's such an intense message and such a personal story. And underneath that, Fifty Shades of Green. CJ? Thank you very much. These are all books. Amazon Prime. You can go through wherever you get good reads, wherever you get your books. Go out, get it, get it in any form you want, and I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. Sir, I thank you. 
Thank you. I appreciate this. You're man. very. I appreciate you. And, and again, so. what an honor to be interviewed by uh, really somebody that I grew up with listening to on the radio. And I, I, it's just a huge, huge honor. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap on the A game. We'll do it again next week. So uh, watch here on Thursday night and through a shared universe. And uh, by the way, a YouTube channel, please like it and follow along because this is episode 92. We're inching closer to number 100. I can't believe I'm saying that. Close. <laughs> We're getting there. Yeah. You already know who's going to we'll be number 100. We'll just yeah. keep the tape rolling, and we'll make a couple right. more episodes yeah. right now. Like, the, we'll, we'll we'll take it. We still the lights are still on. Yeah, what that's the, hell? the scary part. The lights are still on. No, no, no. For Mike Farragher, I'm Rob Akinpour. There's a beer waiting for both of us. We're out of here. Take Amen. care. Have a great week and weekend ahead.